Sophie spotted the rat first. The twins had grown up in New York and had spent most of their summers in California, so encountering a rat was nothing new. Living in San Francisco, a port city, one quickly got used to seeing the creatures, especially early in the morning and late at night, when they come out of the shadows and sewers. Sophie wasn't especially frightened of them, though like everyone else she had heard the horror stories, urban legends and fof, friend of a friend, stories about the scavengers. She knew they were mostly harmless unless cornered. She thought she remembered reading somewhere that they could jump to great heights. She had also read an article in the New York Times Sunday magazine that said that there were as many rats in the United States as there were people. But this rat was different. Sleek and black, rather than the usual filthy brown, it crouched unmoving at the mouth of the alleyway, and Sophie could have sworn that its eyes were bright red, and watching them. Maybe it was an escaped pet? Ah, you noticed, Flamel murmured, catching her arm, urging her forward. We are being watched. Who? Josh asked, confused, turning quickly, expecting to see Dee's long black car cruising down the street. But there was no sign of any car, and no one seemed to be paying them any special attention. Where? The rat in the alleyway, Nicholas Flamel said quickly. Don't look. But it was too late. Josh had already turned and looked. By a rat? A rat is watching us. You can't be serious. He stared hard at the rat, expecting it to turn and scuttle away. It just raised its head and looked at him, its mouth opening to reveal pointed teeth. Josh shuddered. Snakes and rats. He hated them equally, though not as much as he hated spiders. And scorpions. Rats don't have red eyes, do they? He asked, looking at his sister, who, as far as he knew, was afraid of nothing. Not usually, she said. When he turned back, he discovered that there were now two jet black rats standing still in the alleyway. A third scuttled down from the gloom and settled down to watch them. Okay, said Josh said evenly. I've seen men made of mud, and I guess I could ex accept spying rats. Do they talk? He wondered aloud. Don't be ridiculous, Flamel snapped. They're rats. Josh really didn't think it was such a ridiculous suggestion. Has Dee sent them? Sophie asked. He's shocking us. The rats have followed our scents from the shop. A simple scarring spell allows him to see what they see. They are a crude but effective tool. And once they have uh, our scent, they can follow us until we cross water. But I'm more concerned about those. He tilted his chin upward. Sophie and Josh looked up. Gathering on the rooftops of the surrounding buildings were an extraordinary number of black feathered birds. Crows, Flamel said shortly. That's bad? Sophie guessed. From the moment Dee had stepped into the shop, there hadn't been a whole lot of good news. It could be very bad, but I think we'll be okay. We're nearly there. He turned to the left and led the twins into the heart of San Francisco's exotic Chinatown. They passed the Sam Wong Hotel, then turned right into a cramped back street, then immediately left into an even narrower alleyway. Off the relatively clean main streets, the alleyways were piled high with boxes and open bins that stank with that particularly sweet sour odor of rotten food. The narrow alley that they had turned into was especially foul-smelling, the air practically solid with flies, and the buildings on either side rose so high that the passage was in gloomy shadow. I think I'm gonna be sick, Sophie muttered. Only the day before, she had said to her twin that the weeks working in the coffee shop had really heightened her sense of smell. She had boasted that she was able to distinguish odors she had never smelled before. Now she was regretting it. The air was rancid with the stink of rotten fruit and fish. Josh just nodded. He was concentrating on breathing through his mouth, though he imagined that every foul breath was coating his tongue. Nearly there, Flamel said. He seemed unaffected by the rank odors whirling about them. The twins heard a rasping, skittering sound and turned in time to see five jet-black rats scramble across the tops of the open bins behind them. A huge black crow settled on one of the wires that crisscrossed the alleyway. Nicholas Flamel suddenly stopped outside a plain, unmarked wooden door, so encrusted with grime that it was virtually indistinguishable from the wall. There was no handle or keyhole. Spreading his right hand wide, Flamel placed his fingertips at specific locations and pressed. The door clicked open. Grabbing Sophie and Josh, he pulled them into the shadow and eased the door shut behind them. 
After the bitter stench of the alleyways, the hallway smelled wonderful, sweet with jasmine and other subtle exotic odors. The twins breathed deeply. Bergamot, Sophie announced, identifying the orange odor. And Lang Lang and Patchouli, I think. I'm impressed, Flamel said. I got used to the herbs in the tea shop. I love the odors of the exotic teas. She stopped, suddenly realizing that she was talking as if she would never go back to the shop and smell its gorgeous odors again. Right about now, the first of the early afternoon crowd would be coming in, ordering cappuccinos and lattes, iced tea and herbal infusions. She blinked away the sudden tears that prickled at her eyes. She missed the coffee cup because it was ordinary and normal and real. Where are we? Josh asked, looking around now that his eyes had become accustomed to the dim light. They were standing in a long, narrow, spotlessly clean hallway. The halls were covered in smooth, blonde wood, and there were intricately woven white reed mats on the floor. A simple doorway covered in what looked like paper stood at the opposite end of the corridor. Josh was about to take a step forward towards the door when Flamel's iron hand clamped onto his shoulder. Don't move, he murmured. Wait, look, notice. If you keep those three words in mind, you just might survive the next few days. Digging into his pocket, he pulled out a quarter. Positioning it on his thumb, he flicked it into the air. It spun over and over and began to fall toward the middle of the hallway. There was a barely perceptible hiss, and a needle-tipped dart punched right through the metal coin, impaling it in midair and pinning it to the opposite wall. You've left the safe and mundane world you once knew. Nicholas Flamel said seriously, looking at each twin in turn. Nothing is as it seems. You must learn to question everything, to wait before moving, to look before stepping, and to observe everything. I learned these lessons in alchemy, but you will find them invaluable in this new world you've unwittingly wandered into. He pointed down the corridor. Look and observe. Tell me, what do you see? Josh spotted the first tiny hole in the wall. It was camouflaged to look like a knot in the wood. Once he found the first one, he realized that there were dozens of holes in the walls. He wondered if each hole held a tiny dart that was powerful enough to punch through metal. Sophie noticed that the floor did not join neatly with the wall. In three separate places, on both the left and right hand sides, close to the skirting, there was a definite gap. Flamel nodded. Well done. Now watch. We've seen what the darts can do, but there's another defense. He took a tissue out of his pocket and tossed it onto the floor, close to one of the narrow openings. There was a single metallic clink, and then a huge half-moon-shaped blade popped out from the wall, sliced the tissue into confetti, and slid back into hiding. So if the darts don't get you, Josh began, the blades will, Sophie finished. Well, how do we get to the door? We don't. Flamel said, and turned to push on the wall to the left. An entire section clicked open and swung back, allowing the trio to step into a huge airy room. The twins recognized the room immediately. It was a dojo, a martial arts school. Since they were little, they had studied Taekwondo in Dojang like this across the United States, as they traveled with their parents from university to university. Many schools had martial arts clubs on campus, and their parents always enrolled them in the best dojo they could find. Both Sophie and Josh were red belts, one rank below the black belt. Unlike other dojos, however, this one was plain and unadorned, decorated in shades of white and cream, with white walls and black mats dotted across the floor. But what immediately caught their attention was the single figure dressed in a white t-shirt and white jeans sitting with its back to them in the center of the room. The figure's spiky, bright red hair was the only spot of color in the entire dojo. We've got a problem, Nicholas Flamel said simply, addressing the figure. You've got a problem. That's nothing to do with me. The figure didn't turn, but the voice was surprisingly both female and young, the accent soft and vaguely Celtic. Irish or Scottish, Sophie thought. Dee found me today. It was only a matter of time. He came after me with golems. There was a pause. Still, the figure didn't turn. He was always a fool. You don't use golems in a dry climate. That is his arrogance. He has taken Paranelli prisoner. Ah, that's tough. He'll not harm her, though. And she has the codex. 
The figure moved, coming slowly to her feet and turning to face them. The twins were shocked to discover that they were looking at a girl not much older than themselves. Her skin was pale, dappled with freckles, and her round face was dominated by grass-green eyes. Her red hair was so vibrant that Sophie wondered if she had dyed it that color. A codex? The accent was definitely Irish, Sophie decided. The book of Abraham the Mage. Nicholas Flamel nodded. Then you're right, we do have a problem. Flamel reached into his pocket and pulled out the two pages Josh had torn from it. Well, nearly all of the book. He's missing the final summoning. The young woman hissed, the sound like that of water boiling, and a quick smile flickered across her face. Which he will want, of course. Of course. Josh was watching the red-haired young woman intently, noting how he stood perfectly still, like most of the martial arts teachers he knew. He glanced sidelong at his sister and raised his eyebrows in a silent question as he inclined his chin slightly toward the girl. Sophie shook her head. They were curious why Nicholas Flamel treated her with such obvious respect. Sophie had also come to the conclusion that there was something wrong about the girl's expression, but she couldn't quite put her finger on it. It was an ordinary face. Perhaps the cheekbones were a little too prominent, the chin a little too pointed, but the emerald-colored eyes caught and held one one's attention. And then Sophie realized with a start that the girl didn't blink. The young woman suddenly threw back her head and breathed deeply, her nostrils flaring. Is that why I can smell eyes? Flamel nodded. Rats and crows everywhere. And you brought them here? There was a note of accusation in her voice. I've spent years building this place. If D has the codex, then you know he will be what he will do with it. The young woman nodded. She turned her wide green eyes onto the twins. And these two? She asked, finally acknowledging their presence. They were there when Dee attacked. They fought for me, and this young man managed to tear the pages from the book. This is Sophie, and this is her twin, Josh. Twins? The young woman stepped forward and looked at each of them in turn. Not identical, but I can see the resemblance now. She turned to Flamel. You're not thinking... I'm thinking this is an intentionary turn of events, Flamel said mysteriously. He looked at the twins. I'd like to introduce you to Scatthatch. She'll probably not tell you much about herself, but I'll tell you that she is of the Elder Race and has trained every Vorian hero of legend for the past 2,000 years. In mythology, she was known as the Hoyer Maid, the Shadow, the Demon Slayer, the Kingmaker, the... Oh, just called me Scatty. The young woman said, her cheeks turning the same color as her hair.